the general consideration. So understanding, so it's sections 8.183, understanding boundary layer growth within internal flow and its differences from external flow versus internal flow, because there's some things that are you know, very different in internal flow versus external flow. And then the second set of slides, which I mistakenly was just at, deals with now all those correlations that come from it, right? The equations for different situations for NISLT number and that. Okay, so we gotta first understand what is happening with this boundary layer. So we're gonna start off with, just like we did before, some of the things you would have, knowledge you would have from fluids, right? So we have these different regions. We have entrance conditions. So if we started off with, what you see here, a uniform temperature or uniform velocity profile. And then as soon as you start hitting that internal pipe, you know, our boundary layer starts growing. Okay, and it grows all around this pipe. Like it's a circular cross section is growing and then all of a sudden, here's where it meets. And we have our length for fully developed, okay? So once that distance hits, we don't have this entrance effects of the boundary layer growing and then meeting. We have now a fully developed profile. And the profile is this parabolic velocity profile for laminar, right? That is the same. So if we're here and then we go here, it's gonna be the same velocity profile. And it's not going to be, it's not a function of X. That's what that's saying right there, right? So this is hydrodynamically fully developed. So this deals with the velocity profile. Turbulent flow, right? We have that more kind of blunt profile because of all that momentum, right? So thermal effects, so this is the new part to it, okay? Thermal effects, so again, we're looking at laminar. We have a uniform temperature coming in, so if all this, you have this fluid coming in, it's all the same temperature initially hits the tube, we're gonna have now the boundary layer growing for the, for the thermal boundary layer growing, okay? And once, it grows and meets, we're gonna have the point where we are now fully developed. So that's a thermally fully developed boundary layer. Before that, we have entrance effects, okay? After it, we're, you know, we're thermally developed. So that's gonna now an extra step in changing our calculations of whether we have entrance effects or we fully developed, okay? And when we're talking about temperature, you see the profile now doesn't change. The profile we're talking about is the dimensionless form of temperature, okay? Temperature itself changes. The dimensionless form of temperature does not. And that basically uses the surface temperature and the mean temperature, okay? So we're gonna be looking at kind of surface minus T over surface minus T mean. If we're looking at that at any point where this T right here is the, you know, any point in the R and X, and this is in the X, and this is X and R, X, X, so at any point like here, right, that's X, R is, along that, right, at different points along the R. Well, this is our dimensionless form of temperature, okay, and that does not change once you're fully developed, okay, because you're going to have the same profile. So the temperature itself may change, but the non-dimensionalized form of it does not that deals with temperature differences, okay? So in there, it's thermally fully developed once you're past that region. Okay, so that's a new thing to add to our our check, right? In our, what form of Nusselt number are we gonna need, okay?
All right, so one of the main things within internal flow versus external flow is external flow, we had these well-defined free stream conditions. So external flow, we had U infinity and T infinity, right? Because we had this flat plate, we had this boundary layer growing, and outside here is always U infinity, T infinity, right? While when we look at internal flow, where's the outside, right? We're at the middle, but that's going to be changing. Right? We said surface, this mean temperature or whatever, the surface temperature is going to be changing, right? If we put a uniform surface temperature on this outside or we put a uniform heat flux on this outside, one or the other, like let's say we put a heat flux, right? It's a constant heat flux boundary condition, right? So you either have one or the other, right? Well, if we're constantly adding a heat flux as you move down the pipe, the temperature of the fluid is going to get hotter and hotter. The profile again, the non-dimensionalized profile is going to stay the same, but we're constantly adding heat to it, right? So the temperature changes, so we don't have a nice T infinity there, right? The temperature is changing. So we use, instead, we use a mean velocity and mean temperature in internal flow, okay? So that's what we have. To define then for internal flow is the mean velocity and the mean temperature. Well, mean velocity define it uh, in fluids, but we'll do it again here. Okay, if we looked at mass flow rate, which is the same one we used back in thermo, m dot is rho v a, so or here it's the mean velocity, which is what we are actually using back in thermo is the mean velocity uh, in cross sectional area. But if we wanted to get it off of not knowing the mean and knowing the how velocity changed in the x and r direction, we would integrate across that cross section. So now if we set these two equations equal to each other, we can solve for the mean velocity. Okay, and that's what you see here. Okay, and that's our mean velocity. And if we simplify this equation for incompressible flow in circular tube, so incompressible flow gets this density out of the integral, and then we can cancel it. Circular tube defines what that cross-sectional area is and what that change we're going to be looking at, and that simplifies it, and we get this equation right here okay, for the mean velocity. Well, we can do a similar thing to get our mean temperature. So instead, we look at what, we, again, from thermo, we had energy transport thermal energy transport, we talked about mass flow rate and enthalpy, where mass flow rate carried an enthalpy. Well, with, say, a gas or an incompressible fluid flowing, we can look at it as mass flow rate CPT, right? And that T is now the mean temperature, right? Terrible math. Okay, well, so we have then also the version where we can integrate across, sec across the cross section with the individual temperature throughout that cross circular cross section, let's say, or and the individual velocity as a change with x and r, and integrate. Okay. Well, if we set these two equations equal, like they are here, and just solve for the mean temperature, so we get this. We're just rearranging for Tm. So that's our equation. Again, if we use incompressible constant properties in a circular tube, we can simplify the equation above by moving density out, putting in rho uh, density, mean velocity, and area for mass flow rate, and then knowing how the cross-sectional areas, it allows us to uh, change some things, bring CP out, cancel CP because we brought it out. So these different things, simplify it for mean for a circular tube and compressible constant properties to that, okay? We also have for local heat flux at any point along that tube, say we want the point right here. If we know the mean velocity, we know the surface temperature, so we know the mean temperature. 
we can get use Newton's law of cooling for the local heat flux. All right, so we said there is entry length issues, right? We said we have thermal entry length, we have the hydrodynamic entry length, okay? So we need to define how to get there. So that's where we use our Reynolds number, okay? For internal flow, we use our diameter, okay? We can also have different cross-sectional areas, so that's where we use a hydro hydraulic diameter, so make equivalent cross-section, whether it's kind of a square or any kind of internal cross-sectional area and, and repurpose it as a hydraulic diameter. We also have a nicer version for Reynolds number and mass flow rate, because sometimes all we have, is we have a mass flow rate measurement, not a velocity measurement, so we can use one directly with mass flow rate, and here's our perimeter. Or if it's circular tube, so ready putting in the perimeter, we get a nice equation for mass with using mass flow rate and just diameter, right? And then property of our viscosity there. All right, so if we calculate that Reynolds number of our internal flow, we determine um, whether we're laminar or turbulent, okay? And we're going to use. 2300 as our onset of turbulence. So for below 2300, for laminar, for above, we're turbulent, right? So it starts being turbulent at 2300. You get really full, fully turbulent at 10,000, but we're just going to say at you know 2300 fully turbulent, right? All right. So now with our Reynolds number defined, we can use that with our relationships to determine our entrance length. So for velocity, the hydrodynamic entry length, we have laminar flow, our, our distance that we are along the, the tube where it's still developing, we can relate it to divided by diameter, and we have 0.05 times the Reynolds number. That'll tell us how long we have where our uh, velocity profile is still developing. Thermal, and, and then, oh, sorry, turbulent for, for the velocity, ranges between 10 and 60, but the book, we're going to just use 10 because it's better to have just a simple, you know, draw line in the sand than have this range here. So we're going to use 10 as our, our condition for, you know, if it's less than 10, that ratio, then it's still developing greater than 10. We're going to say it's uh, fully developed turbulent flow, okay, for the velocity. But thermal, also has a laminar and a turbulent condition. Turbulent, we're going to still use 10, okay, even though it has a range, the book's going to use 10 as its hard and fast rule. Laminar looks very similar to the hydrodynamic. We also have, we have a Prandtl number that we're multiplying at times, okay. So it's still 0.05 Reynolds number, but we're multiplying at times Prandtl number. So this Prandtl number right here will change things, right? So if it's less than one, Prandtl numbers equal to one, or Prandtl numbers greater than one, right? It tells us things, right? So if we had a Prandtl number, let's say, first, let's start a Prandtl number of like a thousand, what does that mean for the thermal entry length versus the hydrodynamic entry length? Thermal lengths much greater. Right. So the thermal entry length is going to be much, much greater. So that's almost like if it's that high, it's almost like the velocity entrance length is so short it's negligible that it's basically always uh, hydrodynamically fully developed in that realm because you're waiting for a thousand times more length for the thermal to even develop. Okay. All right, and then can flow be developing hydrodynamically and be thermally fully developed? So that would be where you're thermally, you're fully developed, right? But you're still developing the velocity. That's really not 
you know, possible because the when you think about it, temperature always requires velocity inside of it to get even the mean temperature. It requires velocity in it, right? We have it in here. When you look at velocity, there's nothing with temperature in this equation or here, right? So velocity in the the hydrodynamic uh, profile does not, you know, it doesn't require temperature to be fully developed, but the temperature profile requires velocity to be fully developed, okay? All right, so now we hit fully developed conditions, all right? So we're fully developed. Now we can look at some things here and say, okay, some good proper, some good calculations out of it. What if we want the pressure drop, right? So all we would need is some, some properties, geometry, the velocity, and the friction factor, okay? And the friction factor for laminar is a nice simple equation, right, in a circular tube. This looks like that. For turbulent in a smooth tube, it's a nice simple equation, okay? But if we have some surface roughness, okay, then we have Moody, the Moody diagram, okay? So then we can get our friction factor from it. Okay, if we wanted, we can go and grab our friction factor and we can calculate our pressure drop. So across some distance right here, or whether that, if that's the length of the tube, we could calculate the pressure change, knowing the friction factor, flow velocity, length, diameter, density, right? And then if we wanted, take that even further to power, right? So if we have, have that pressure drop and we multiply it times our volumetric flow, that's our power requirement, okay? So that means to have this certain amount of pressure drop in a tube, that's the power to drive that tube, right? So if you're thinking about a pump, that would be your pressure loss due to friction, right? Not due to height, but due to, you know, frictional loss if you're pushing a tube pushing a flow through a tube, right? Or if you're thinking about, you know, more in my area, if exhaust out of an engine, the power to push the exhaust out of an engine's exhaust is from that pressure drop, right? You have that pressure drop, the pressure drop you have in the exhaust is the power that you're uh, required to push that exhaust out of it. All right, so we already kind of talked about it, but that non-dimensional um, temperature profile, this is the equation, right? Here's our equation, the temperature of the surface. So if we're looking at this tube, let me just make sure I have the diagram the same as they did. this profile that looks like this, you know, we're looking at the temperature right here is at radial, so here's this X position, right? And then the radial is at these different points along it, right, which means it's those. We have the temperature of the surface, so that's that point, and then the mean temperature of that profile, okay? And if you're at this position of X, or you're at this position, so you're at X1 or you're at X2, the profile is going to be this, this non dimensional temperature profile is going to be the same. Okay, even though the temperature at the surface, TS1, TS2, TS2 could be greater than TS1, the profile, this non dimensional profile is not changing. Okay. So what does that mean for our local convection coefficient? If you go back to chapter six, we talked about the convection coefficient being related to that slope right there at that, that, at that surface, right? Well, if this profile is not changing, then that slope is not changing from the profile at X1 to X2, if that slope isn't changing, because we're looking at delta T, so if that slope isn't changing, 
then the convection coefficient isn't changing. And that's what you see down here in this plot, that once you hit this fully developed, we have the same convection coefficient. Before that, the convection coefficient is changing because the, the temperature profile is changing. So that is changing that slope right there at that point on the wall. All right, we have that dt dy at y equals zero, all right? So that's changing, which means our convection coefficient's changing. So that's why, you see after it's fully developed, it's a constant value, okay? All right, so now we can utilize this information to get how the mean temperature is changing as a function of x. We want to know that, that value, all right? So if we take this tube right here, so it has an inlet, an outlet, and we're taking this little section right here, right? If we look at that little section, it has mass flow rate carrying in energy, and it has mass flow rate carrying out. Right. So if we look at that, we have mass rate CP carrying in TM and carrying out TM plus DM. Okay, so if we have out minus in, we have this, right? And the TMs cancel. So we have M dot CP and the change in temperature. So that's just like M dot change in enthalpy, right? Or for you know for gas, CP delta T. So we have equation. That's the same one we use in thermo a whole bunch, right? Well, we can relate that now. That Q now that's happening is convection right here. So we can relate that to convection, which is, in this case, they're showing it as heat flux times this area, which is perimeter times dx, okay? So now we can relate that heat transfer or that heat that we have of m dot Cp delta T to the heat from, say, Newton's law of cooling or, or so forth. So what we did back in thermo one and thermo two, we might have been given temperatures, and then we just calculated the amount of heat, or we were given heat and we calculated the outlet temperature. So now, though, we have, when we integrate this equation, Right, across this whole thing, we can get our inlet, outlet, m dot CP, and Q. So now we can relate what that is, this m dot delta T, m, m dot CP delta T, to heat transfer. So the heat tra bringing in those heat transfer equations puts in sizing and uh, what's going on with the actual heat transfer and not just assuming it's going to work. So some of the things when we did like boilers, or condensers back in, in Thermo 2, we could have just been sizing it for a boiler that could have been, you know, infinitely large to get that amount of heat transfer, something that's not practical, or a condenser, right? Just because we just said, oh, we want this outlet temperature, so here it is. Well, bringing in the heat transfer equations into that Q will bring in the practicality and the sizing required to do that, okay? And that's where we're, we have here with this equation. So we're looking at how the mean temperature is changing, okay? So I'm gonna bring back this and this. So DQ is M dot CP DTM. But it's also the heat flux at the surface, the convection, perimeter dx, that's our surface area, okay? Or we could look at it with Newton's law of cooling at that local point, h delta t, and then the surface area again. Okay, so first off, for uniform heat flux, I'm gonna use these two and set those equal. So if I do that, And then put the dt over d dt over dx. Okay. 
we have what you see here. And what that is, is not a, this, this change in temperature with respect to the change in X is not a function of X, right? So it's a con all these are constants. It's a uniform surface heat flux, so that's a constant. Perimeter is a constant. Mass flow is a constant. Specific heat is a constant. So we have all that is just a constant. Okay. So that means when we integrate this equation, you just can have a constant times x. So the mean temperature as a function of x just changes, and we have our constant right here. So it just changes uh, by that constant. So once you're fully developed, which is where this comes from, and you can see it right here, we get this. Same change right here. Okay. And you can see, the other thing you can see is, you see that the temperature, the mean temperature is constantly increasing, same with the surface temperature, because you're, you're putting in a uniform surface heat flux, so you're constantly putting in more heat, right? So that mean temperature is changing as you change X, right? But the, again, that profile, that non-dimensional profile is not changing, right? But the actual temperatures are, but when you non-dimensionalize the temperature profile, it's not changing. So now we're going to switch to uniform surface temperature. So with this derivation for how the temperature changes, okay, so we have how the mean temperature is going to change for uniform surface heat flux, so we have how it changes throughout that tube. So we can go all the way to the outlet and get what that is, okay. Uh, for, and for the uniform surface temperature, we're going to take this one and set it to this one. Okay. And if we do that same thing, dt over d or dt over dx, and then move everything else around, we get this equation equal to this one. Okay. And they just change what this dt is to this dt. Okay, because it's a constant surface temperature. So if we take the derivative with with uh, the surface temperature there, it's just going to be zero. So they're able to put that in there, which allows them to relate this to this. So that means they can integrate. Okay. So we integrate, and we get this equation. So at any point in x, we can get the mean temperature when we have a uniform surface temperature. Okay. They even put in the average convection coefficient into the equation. The whole derivation is shown in the book. Okay. All right. So if we know the inlet conditions, we know the surface temperature because it's constant. Okay, that's what you see here. Then we can get what that outlet temperature is going to be at any point along that tube. So if we go all the way to X equals L, then we end up with the equation you see right here at the bottom, okay? It's just the outlet instead. So we can figure out the outlet temperature knowing the convection coefficient and the perimeter length, right? Mass flow rate, CP, inlet conditions, surface temperature. So now with understanding of what's going on heat transfer wise, so in this case convection inside that tube, and then the surf area of that tube, so how long, basically the perimeter and length, so the geometry of that tube, we can figure out what that outlet temperature would be, what that actual outlet temperature is, okay? 
if we want to bring this back to heat transfer, the amount of heat transfer, we can basically put this equation together. If you put this equation together with this one, you end up with what you see here. Okay, it has H surface area, and then this new defined term here, which we'll also see in heat in um, heat exchangers, is this log mean temperature difference. And that's because we have a situation where the mean temperature is changing from the inlet to the outlet, right? So then what do you use as the temperature to take and subtract from the surface temperature? And so that's basically what this log mean temperature difference is telling us, is that delta T relates it back to Newton's law of cooling, this log mean temperature difference. But that equation basically comes out of if you use this one with this one together. You derive that that one. Okay. All right, so another boundary condition that could occur is uniform external fluid temperature. So now we're not putting in a constant heat flux, right? We, we're not at constant surface temperature. So the new one is, okay, and practically is, what if you now know that the outlet external fluid temperature and its external convection coefficient? Okay, so this is a tube with just air blowing over the outside, right? So you have internal flow and you have external flow over the outside, okay? So what this would look like is you just change this last equation from knowing the surface temperature, because you don't now, to knowing the convection. So that means you know T infinity, this fluid temperature. So it still gets you the outlet temperature. If you know, So it still gets you this outlet temperature right here. You know the inlet, let's say. Now instead of the convection coefficient, we put in the overall heat transfer coefficient. And if you remember that relates basically to the overall thermal circuit. So if I looked at this, we would have T mean mean, so the basically the inlet an outlet's average, and that would have convection internally. Then there would be conduction. Through the wall. And then you'd have the convection here, okay? So then you have your convection outside. T infinity here. Okay. So your R total is summing up those resistances. And your overall convection coefficient is one over R total. And that's what this is doing right here between these two. So you see this equal to this. So they're just putting in that resistance instead of the overall convection coefficient or one of the, whichever way you want to do it. And still, you can utilize that log mean temperature difference, but with the overall convection coefficient here. Okay. So the main thing in this one, in these three cases I just showed you is we had 
uniform surface temperature, or sorry, uniform heat flux, if we have a tube and we're just putting a constant heat flux into it, right? So that's a common boundary condition. Like if we have an electric heater on the outside of the tube, we're just putting in this constant heat flux, right? Well, we can get our exiting mean temperature if we just change X to L, okay? And that uh, relates it so we can get the exit temperature and we just put that in, we, we can get our outlet, okay? If we have uniform surface temperature, so that's a condition when we have, say, boiling or condensation on the outside of the tube. So if we're boiling, we're keeping, like, on the outside of the tube, we have, like, running a tube through a boiler, let's say. Then that water that's hitting the outside of that boiler tube is keeping that outside of that boiler tube the same temperature. So we have a uniform surface temperature. Okay, or condensation, say that's a uniform surface temperature. So in that boundary condition, we have these equations here that we've, we've went through and derived, and we can figure out what the outlet temperature is on our heat. Okay. And now instead, and in the other situation I'm showing here that I went over is, okay, maybe we don't know, it's not a constant heat flux, it's not a constant surface temperature, but what's being held constant is this ex, uh, external outernal, outer flow. So we have this external flow cross flow over the outside of that tube. And now we can understand what's going on with the amount of heat and the outlet conditions of the temperature at the outlet based upon these two equations. Okay, so these are very, these three kind of situations that I showed are very common, basically the boundary conditions you have that's happening for you for the situation and the design you're looking at so in this case we're just looking at a single tube in this chapter in chapter 11 i believe i can't remember what number it is when we go to uh, heat exchangers we'll be looking at similar things with bundles of tubes okay and then we start on our examples and i'm going to actually stop here for the last section, so I'm going to stop here again. Any questions? Doctor? Yes. Uh, I have a question, but not about chapter eight, about the homework for chapter seven, if you don't mind, if we can meet at uh, the Zoom meet, uh, office. Yeah, yeah, right afterwards, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Well, then that's it for today. Uh, we'll continue on with chapter eight on Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.